Hello, welcome to The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison produced by the Capital Times. For someone outside the Jewish faith, cooking kosher looks incredibly daunting. When Chef Jason Kears got a job as the culinary director for Hillel, the Jewish Student Center at UW-Madison, he had to learn it all from scratch, from washing individual lettuce leaves to making over the menu during Passover. I am your host, Cap Times food writer Lindsay Christians, and this week on the podcast, I'm chatting with Jason about what it means to cook kosher, what happens when he tries to riff on the classics, and how he's building bridges with brisket. Give a listen. Welcome, Jason. <laughs> I'm glad to be here. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm curious about how you first got started cooking kosher. Is this something that you had done before you started this this job? No, I didn't even know that there was a Hillel Foundation at the University of Wisconsin. I didn't know what it was or what it was about. I thought it was the name of a restaurant uh, when applying. Uh, I just I saw an ad and said that uh, decent pay and no uh, Saturday nights working. I was like, well, listen, I'm a young uh, family man with uh, kids at home and I've been doing this inter- uh, restaurant industry for some time and haven't actually spent any type of holidays or birthdays or just notable you know, weekends with the kids. So let's just give it a shot. And so I got to learn a little bit about what Hillel is and uh, it's all uphill and downhill at the same time. <laughs> So when you first started, how did you learn, like, what were some of the first things that, that you learned, the first things that kind of surprised you about the differences in cooking kosher? Well, the differences are huge. One, it's incredibly clean. Luckily, I've worked in fine dining establishments that are known for, uh, you know, being top of their game for sanitation. And so that was the first observation. Then I noticed it's generally large in comparison to other kitchens, and that's because Certain vessels can't touch each other, and uh, everything has to have a separate uh, uh, dimension or, or, you know, par versus meat versus uh, dairy. Parv parv is interesting. Parv is basically, for all intents and purposes, vegetables. But fish is technically parv. Fish is parv, but it's not a vegetable. It's also technically chicken. Chicken is technically a vegetable. Because this is this is going to be the most uh, confusing interview possible, but this is what I do every single day, and I actually am fairly good at it. You can't have dairy and meat. The people say, well, that's the number one thing that people hear about with kosher, and where does that come from? So it's a Bible verse, and it says that you can't eat something that's uh, lied in its own milk. So basically, if it's a mammal and you use milk for nourishment, you can't eat it. Chickens. Chickens have eggs. Chickens are technically the same as a fish. However, there are laws. So laws are either through the Torah, they're done through the uh, rabbis, or they're done through unwritten laws that are just handed down. And so the rabbis got together and said, this is too doggone confusing. We're just going to make chicken, you know, meat. And so now chicken is meat. Even though technically by the law, it's technically parv, it's a vegetable. Weird stuff. This is what I do every single day. <laughs> so when you were first were getting started, you were like, okay, i, I got to figure out the definitions of these things first, or you just kind of jump in and start washing lettuce? I remember the first time doing it because, one, you, when you're a chef, you are generally cocky as it is, and you have a big ego, and you think, whatever, I can do this. And so I had – it was a husband-wife team that were watching me. I think they were just as curious to, about me as I was about them. I don't think I probably even ever met an Orthodox Jew before. And it's kind of a weird dynamic because, especially when you come through a fine dining kitchen, you're used to the, you know, the hierarchy and the uh, brigade system. And this is my kitchen and this is how it goes. And it's still your kitchen at Halal. It's still my kitchen, but they have the power to say it's not kosher, which that's pretty doggone, uh, uh, it's a lot of power. So having someone watch you, everything you do, watching, judging. I've been married for over about 10 years, so I'm kind of used to that by now. So actually, it wasn't that big a deal. Uh, I just keep going. I'm sure I'm going to make a mistake, and they'll let me know. And it's just like marriage. I learn to fix it and keep moving on. So If they say it's not kosher, do you have to throw it out? It depends on what it is, and I've done <gasps> it before. Have you had to throw stuff out before? Oh, absolutely. I've, 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 uh, it's called trafe when you make a mistake. Uh, some things can be fixed. Some things can. Uh, I think it's kind of interesting when I have new cooks come in, especially the ones that are very talented and skilled. They'll act like they know what they're doing. I let them, I give them the, the rope and let them hang themselves because I just know it's coming. 
when you try to do too many things at once or you try to – we have basically three kitchens within one. We have a parv kitchen, a dairy kitchen, and meat, and we have certain events. So we might have a meat event going on at the cafe and then have a dairy event going on at some other uh, synagogue or shul, but that we still work within the same system. That's when you make the most mistakes. That's when a mosque has to be on their toes watching because that's when, you know, if you cut a vegetable, a vegetable is a vegetable, you know, but – if depending on what that vegetable is and how you, what knife you used, you could mess up my entire oven by putting it in, you know, and and mess up my vessel, mess up, you know, the uh, cooking, you know, apparatus. So like sheet trays, I can't recosh them because it has a lip on them, and that lip, you know, you can't. You have to be able to make sure you get everything in there clean. There's no way to know if there's some other residue in there. So to kosher, which basically means to neutralize, I'd have to be able to pull that lip. I can't do it. So. Every time that we mess up on a sheet tray, it's 50 bucks gone. Oh, my gosh. It's expensive to do what we do. That's crazy. Not so, to mention the pay to watch the person to tell me that I got to throw it away. <laughs> so it's adding this sort of level of complexity on top of all the things all the things you know how to do and you do well. You know, you come into this, this new system. Um, were there some kind of initial barriers for you, things that were like it took you kind of a while to get into your head or into your hands? Or did you pick it up pretty quick? Surprisingly, I did – Pick it up kind of quick. I, I, I definitely feel strongly that you can't be a dumb kosher chef. Uh, you always have to think of the end product. Chefs are, are just like any type of mechanical engineer or any type of, you know, manufacturing. They have, uh, you know, orders they have to put out. They have a certain bandwidth of time, labor, materials to work with. And they have to figure out how to do it. Some chefs are, you know, better at others. Some are more on the creative side. Some are more on the financial side. I'm probably more on the financial and uh, still to this day learning the creative component of what I do. And so, uh, like, learning lettuce. So with us, we not only have to always sell you uh, washed lettuce, which everyone should have, you know, lettuce is not directly from the ground. But our lettuce is, it doesn't even matter if it comes in. With a big sign that says triple washed, we have to wash it again. It's called a hazaka check, and it's under a UV light. And every, pretty much every leaf that's going through is being checked for a bug. And you would be surprised how many bugs that we're actually eating out there. I was, uh, uh, I, there was one time that I got in a, a, a heated uh, conversation with one of my Moscow. Cause I was like, dude, you got to be planting bugs in there. Like, seriously, you, you've done this batch. Like, 10 times like you're killing my lettuce because every time that you wash you know especially basil it bruises and it might be the cleanest dog on lettuce out there but it's not going to be edible because you eat with your eyes and it looks like looks like crap you know you're messing up my lettuce man uh and then i went to go do the hazaka check as well and we just got a bad batch i mean we try to buy all of our greens uh you know like uh, right now we're buying it from vitruvian out of mcfarland and, and last summer it was a rainy summer and we just had a bad batch of bugs I actually was forced to buy the stuff I didn't want to buy, which was the, you know, the half the price, you know, big, you know, factory. You Irradiated know. Yeah. or whatever, yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, someone washes in a big tub. Like, I was forced to do that because of the, my bug situation. Wow. And so so you're checking it to make sure that, that, that all the bugs have been removed? Yes, that's a huge uh, law within the Orthodox diet that uh, people think pork is a big deal. Bugs are just as bad, if not worse, than than pork or shellfish. So they're looking. I mean, we're talking. You would never even see it. Uh, I mean, they're translucent. You know, white flies, aphids, and we're talking. I do like twenty five to thirty pounds of mixed greens in a week. If I find one bug, and I did that whole batch at once, I have to do the whole batch over again. Because you know that there's others in there. Because we found one. All hazaka check. All I do cash root is nothing but law. I'm practicing law all day long without a degree. For example, we have a hydroponic system on the third floor, and you know people are like, oh, that's cool. Uh, we we partner with Reap a lot, and they uh, from my understanding of talking with them is that uh, we're the only restaurant in town that has a hydroponic system dedicated to the restaurant. And the reason why we have it is not to be cool, because yeah, growing stuff without dirt, yeah, that sounds cool. But the reason why we do it is state of the art for cash root because. Dirt generally brings bugs. We're trying to eliminate that hazaka check. So we're trying to work within the law to get us to where we want to go. Uh, and so in Israel, they've started where they do uh, hydroponic system and they put uh, a 
mosquito net over it, and then I have to have it checked a number of times before the uh, we'll get basically a free and clear. But we haven't got to that part yet to where we want to go. But I'm just I'm getting my case ready to be pled in front of the rabbinical courts. I, I'm curious about um, some of the some of the things that you've made that are kind of a riff. So, like, chefs are creative people. You know, you're a creative person. Um, when you look at, like, okay, so here are some of the standard dishes, you know, like a shakshuka, for example, and you want to do a riff on it. Um, what are some of the challenges behind being creative with some of the standards? There's challenges, but then there's also – there are challenges, I think, that are in our heads. Uh, it wasn't until I took this job and my wife uh, came diagnosed with a dairy allergen that I realized, sorry, Wisconsin, it's not that big a deal to be cheeseless. It really isn't that big a deal. You can survive without cheese. So when you, you know, when you work at like Delmonico's or Cinto, it's so easy to do a steak and put a, you know, a nice um, maitre d' butter on there or, you know, or every sauce is finished with butter. And, and you know what? You're going to get a lovely velvety sauce and everything's going to be great. But imagine if you don't have that, uh, you're not allowed to do that. But you, you're you expected. I mean, it may not be. People think that, but I feel like I'm expected to put out that quality of food without the use of those products. So I have to think a little bit smarter, a little bit, you know, I use, I've gotten where I use cornstarch a lot and potato starch. Uh, I've gotten to where, uh, I use a lot. I, I used to be completely against soup bases, but because of one dietary law, and also I have to do so much with uh, veggie base. When I did it from scratch, the veggie base turned brown way too fast. So to get that nice color, I had to use. So I buy a specific Osum. It's the best brand out there for a soup base. Uh, it goes against everything as a chef that I've always wanted to do, but with the amount of matzo balls that we go through. You got to do it. I, I had to do it, and I'm, I mean, it's definitely a, a solid brand. Uh, uh, all the, uh, I guess, fusion kind of funky stuff that I've done, it's been hit or miss, but mostly a miss. And I don't think it's because uh, I'm necessarily missing the mark, per se. But like I talked about the shakshuka, I tried bringing a green shakshuka, poblano and tomatillo. It tasted great. I mean, it's a little tart, but it's, it's got tomatillos in it. Uh, but then folks were like, hey, bring back regular shakshuka. I've done did that, and I can't get it off the menu. Like, no one will let me. So from what I've gathered from the Jewish community is that there's not enough establishments out there doing authentic Jewish food that gives me the opportunity to fusion it up, to do something funky. I mean, we have the Ain't No Holla Back Girl that's still a, a number one at uh, Adama, but, I mean, there's really nothing crazy creative with that. I mean... Tell us what's in it. Well, it's it's smoked brisket, uh, but the bun is challah. Uh, I mean, it's a play on the you know the you know the, the ain't no challah back girl song. Uh, that's Gwen Stefani, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that was back in my high school days, I think. <laughs> Me too. Uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, smoked brisket. It's a charred uh, mango and jalapeno uh, barbecue sauce. Then uh, we have tomatoes, pickled uh, peppers. That might be it. Oh, and uh, coleslaw. You have, we have assumed my coleslaw. And the shakshuka, I feel like, I, I want to assume that everybody knows what shakshuka is, but shakshuka is this like wonderful kind of, I, I think of it as like a tomato-based stew, almost yeah. with like cracked eggs on top. Yeah. And I like mine with feta, but I get that. Yeah, no, uh, I think I remember that from the time you did review that you put <laughs> feta on yours. And I would recommend feta. I love it. But not when you're trying to keep kosher oh, fair at enough, a flashic yeah. restaurant. Uh, so Flashic? So fleshig is uh, uh, there's flesh and there's milfix. So that means meat or dairy. Ah. So uh, our certification means that we're allowed to serve meat in the cafe. So if you ever saw anyone, you know, dairy, then you have the ability to say, hey, you guys may not be as kosher, and that's a big deal. So uh, we take that extremely careful. I mean, we have cameras everywhere uh, because I I don't know the actual. Uh, law, but uh, I'm reminded of it quite often, that if there's any type of, if anyone thinks that potentially you might not be kosher, it's the same as not being kosher. So, like, that's why we're so strict on, uh, I mean, we're not, we're we're polite about it, but, like, you can't bring in an outside glass, you can't bring in your water bottle, just because you may have had unkosher tea that you, you know, in there, and it's built on a, on a plate, 
I can't reuse that plate. I have to throw that plate away. How challenging is it to serve people uh, who are a range of orthodoxies, like, a, you know, a range of, I, I guess, strictness? Because I know a lot of people in my life who are Jewish who, you know, some of them, you know, don't eat kosher, but they don't eat pork or, sh- or shellfish. You know, some of them, you know, observe Jewish high holidays, but they don't, you know, modify their diet the rest of the year. There's such a range, I think, of experiences within this, and you have to feed all of them. It's not that difficult because it's kind of, it sounds kind of mean, but it's kind of my way or the highway. Uh, I would say if I was doing an an actual, I'd say probably 1% to 2% of the people that we feed actually keep kosher on a daily basis. Now, uh, because Hillel subsidized a huge portion to maintain kosher food on the UW campus. Uh, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's because the travelers that come that don't have another option, uh, I get called probably once uh, a quarter to go and drop off food, for example, like at the hospital. Uh, If someone is having a transplant, uh, that's probably the number one place that we'll get a phone call. There's not a cooler feeling than uh, I'll I'll get a phone call from someone and say, hey, can you bring food over? Be like, sure. And it happens every time. I'll bring the food over. The family's grieving. They're crying. And they're, they're, um, they think I'm about to make them upset again because they'll be like, I'm sorry, I can't eat this. But then I'll show them the kosher seal and they'll be like, oh, my goodness. I'm able to bring them food that they can actually eat. And it's good. Uh, so, like, that's one of the cool things. Like, I don't get that opportunity when I'm serving, you know, foie gras and, you know, a beautiful demi. Uh, I might get, you know, a nice crowd handful at the end of a beautiful five-course meal. But, you know what, I didn't help a grieving family that had no other place to get some nosh. I, I know that in the past you've done some things with some other chefs, you know, where you do like a little a competition to say, you know, we're going to do a, a kosher cook-off kind of thing, um, Iron Chef style. Um, what are some what are some things that surprise those chefs when they're coming into your kitchen? You know, they see everything separate. They see this larger space. Um, is it is it harder for them than they think it's going to be when they come into your kitchen to learn quickly to cook kosher? Well, so that's an unfair – so <laughs> we – they're scared, and they should be, but we put present it in a way that they really can't fail. Uh, so they have the open kitchen that they can do, but they have more Moschiaks watching them than I ever do. Uh, they're televised, and uh, we separate it so that way we're only doing, let's say, a part of events, so you can only grab part of ingredients. So it's when you have the, you know, uh, I get questioned all the time, like, Jason, you don't agree with this kosher stuff. I'm like, what's keeping you from just lying and not doing it? I was like, well, that's why I want to be watched. I, I believe in human nature, and I want to be watched at all times because I know that God gave me a brain. And if I don't fully embrace this, then, yeah, logically, I'm like, well, I can cut this corner. Nobody's watching. So that's why you need that. Uh, you know, I, I like having that order and structure. It. At one point, I thought, I hate having these people watch me. No, because I don't want any shadow of a doubt of people wondering, you know, is it, did, did, did he have a shrimp in his back pocket <laughs> that he brought in from home? Uh, does does the um, way you cook in the kitchen at Hillel affect how you cook at home now for your family? Has that changed? Oh, anything? actually, it's helped. It's helped immensely. Kosher is, I hate the cliche. People say kosher means quality, but it does mean you can't cut a lot of corners. You have to do a lot of stuff from scratch. Uh, my wife has been uh, diagnosed with a dairy allergen, and so, and we love meat. We're not vegetarians, so it's made it far easier for me to handle dinner for the family. Uh, there is the time that, I, you know, uh, we recently just celebrated anniversary, and uh, I wanted to, you know, I, I always like to cook. That's my love language is to, you know, to throw some food down. And I'm pulling out scallops and shrimp and bacon, and I'm like, I really did. I felt a little dirty. Uh, while cooking it, uh, I mean, I didn't even know what vessel to put it in. I'm like, what do I put it in? Like, uh, so I, I, I'm definitely the most Jewish non-Jew out there. I, it's just, it changes my, uh, the way I open the fridge and like dairy's next to, you know, the meat. Like you can't have that. What's going on here? The other day we were at, uh, Ben and I were dropping off food at InterVarsity and, uh, we, uh, we're so strict on getting folks in and out of the building, uh, at least the kitchen. It's key card access only. And so I'm pulling my key card out to go to the, drop the food off. He's like, dude, you're not in LL. 
you just get so used to your environment. So yes, I quite often, but I also, I, my, I cook a lot with matzah now. I like using, you know, a lot of different bases that I would not normally use. I use now. Yeah. You mentioned InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and I wonder if you see food as a way to kind of create more interfaith connections, to, you know, to create connections between people to, to I don't know, like I, I'm curious about, about well, I think thoughts it's, about that. I think that probably the thing that I most enjoy about my job, besides like the story on being able to provide that spiritual nourishment to a family who's grieving, but I get the chance to have a conversation over washing lettuce and be like, hey, why, you know, why do you do this, you know, tradition? Uh, and I see it, I actually, it sparks a great conversation because I go to Blackhawk Church and Blackhawk, I believe uh, the way they do their sermons is very collegiate. Like they try to teach in a way that lots of graphs and, you know, this is where this would have been, this timing. And so... I'll, it'll gather me questions, and lo- they'll also bring a lot back to actual Hebrew and the language and what the Torah says. And so then I'll bring it back to my Mashkiach. I'm like, hey, hey, I heard this in, you know, this secular uh, class I was at. So will you tell me, was this guy telling the truth? And then he'll be like, actually, yes or no. He was close, but this is where he missed the point. And so then I get to have, you know, both parties are getting something that they wanted. I get a little bit of my spiritual nourishment to understand a little bit of the setting that the pastor messed up, and they almost always mess up because it's so many just, when you get to that level of rules, there's so many ways to misinterpret those rules. And uh, and then for the person who I get to ask the question to, they get to teach. And, you know, I'm sure maybe or maybe not, uh, they, you know, hope one day maybe I'll, you know, get a bona fide, you know, uh, Jewish uh, card or stamp of approval. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think if not, they've, Gained a friend who's appreciated their faith and, you know. Especially in light of some of the political events that have been happening in the past year, um, do you see Hillel as being a sort of, a, a, you know, a, not only a safe haven, but also like representing something much bigger on the UW campus? Like, h- how do you see Hillel's importance and the food that you make as a place for people to connect? How do you, how do you kind of feel about that importance there? When it comes to the actual food component, yes, I do think that it brings people together. We just recently had uh, the – we have it every year, a big tailgate, and Bucky comes out. And I was on the grill, and I saw a group of students come, and I was like, I, I bet those – I mean, they were just wearing traditional uh, Muslim attire, and I bet they they eat halal. And it was a free barbecue, and halal will eat uh, kosher glot. And so I was like, hey, hey, hey. Are you guys uh, halal, by the way? And they're like, yeah. I was like, well, get yourself in here. And then <laughs> they, like, they would never, they were just going to walk right by. They didn't they have any idea. They sat there the entire time. It was like four hours. And they met with so many students, the director, because everyone was like, why are these, you know, yeah. folks in here? And then they come regularly now. I see them coming to Shabbat on, uh, I mean, it, we, that was a chance for folks to come in and say, Hallel is uh, actually kind of cool. Where I deal with, I deal with on the Orthodox level. So it's uh, a lot more rules, uh, depending on who you're talking to, a lot more quote-unquote truths. Uh, but Hallel is pluralistic, so that way it's open to anyone uh, who defines himself as Jewish. I mean, it's anyone, period. Uh, I'm accepted in anyone, my family. But uh, as far as for their actual niche, their student population, uh you know, you can be any type of, you know, reform, reconstruction. Uh, Wisconsin is the second oldest in the entire world. Uh, it's kind of cool. Champagne was the first one. Uh, I, I got to learn a lot of this during our last retreat. I was actually quite impressed with the history of especially this Hillel. That's really cool. That's really cool. So it, it's got this, like, long legacy, and now you're the latest part of it. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, you know, uh, I'm hoping to bring kosher food to a Another level, uh, I mean, I'd have to go to the East Coast or the West Coast to kind of really see what other kosher chefs I got to go to uh, Chicago. Some people say, like, what was the most impactful thing that, you know, taught me, like, what it's like. So actually going to the delis in Chicago, uh, Greg and I, Greg's our director. He took me down there. He's from Chicago. He knew the area. And so some kosher places, some non-kosher places, but they're 
traditional, quote-unquote, Jewish delis. And so I got to see, like, what type of matzo ball soup I actually wanted. I never really tried matzo ball soup before I had to make it myself. Now I think I go toe-to-toe with the best because I actually got to go and I tried, like, eight different matzo balls in one day, and I figured out the, there's floaters and there's sinkers. There's big ones or small ones or some people want vegetables in it. Some people don't. Some people want uh, kibbits and all kinds of other fun stuff in there. So I got to, you know, figure that stuff out. Awesome. What are the hours for now if people want to stop by? So at Talel, they're uh, Thursday through uh, f- Thursday through Sunday, 10 to 8. But on Friday, because of Shabbat, we close at 2, and then we're never open on Saturday. Got it. Got to okay. keep the Sabbath sometime. We don't roll on Shabbos. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming in today, Jason. I really Absolutely. appreciate it. This has been The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison produced by the Capital Times. Editing for the podcast is done by Eric Lawrenson, and our music was composed by Patrick Christians. You can find more food and drinks coverage at captimes.com and subscribe to The Corner Table wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Facebook at Corner Table Podcast. I'm your host, Lindsay Christians, food writer for the Capital Times, and this week my wish for you is fresh pomegranate, one of my favorite fruits of fall. Cheers! Cheers!